When you think about a Hans Zimmer score, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Probably not melody. Maybe you think about the almost synth-like string ostinatos from The Dark Knight, or the layered orchestral textures in Inception, or maybe that catchy vocal riff and sound design from Dune Part 1. And I've seen it said in many comments across the internet that where John Williams is all about themes and melodic ideas, Hans Zimmer is all about texture. While that's a bit of a broad generalization, it's an understandable conclusion. So then, when it came time for Dune Part 2, Hans Zimmer decided, I think I'll write one of the most unshakable melodies in recent memory. This theme has certainly been stuck in my head since I saw the film last weekend, and it's really a masterclass in melodic writing. A real earworm. An ear halud, if you will. This theme can essentially be broken down into two primary sections. I hastily transcribed this tune last night. As far as the exact metering of it, I have no idea, but this is close enough and will at least allow us to understand how this melody was put together. So this A phrase. And if you'll notice, he sort of repeats what he did at the beginning of that. He doesn't go all the way back to the beginning, but... Once again, we sort of rest and we think we're going to resolve, but not quite. Now this time, he's set a certain expectation that we're just going to do that same little motif again, but this time he sort of puts the punctuation mark at the end of it. He saves the majority of the motion, aside from a few ornamental things here and there, for the climax of that melody. One of the first things that we can notice here is that this particular theme does not cover an extremely wide range on the keyboard. <laughs> So it's mostly smaller intervals, like stepwise motion, thirds, fourths, fifths. I don't think he goes beyond a sixth in this whole first theme. The most memorable melodies are usually fairly singable, and this is certainly one way to ensure that we're able to sing it. Obviously an orchestra or a string section or something could play all of these crazy ostinatos that jump and leap around all over the place, but this would fit really well in the range of the human voice. He's also saving the larger leaps for the B part of this theme, which we'll get to in a bit. In the A theme, everything adheres pretty much to A major. Very comfy, very centered in that A major tonic feel. The first iteration of this melody is just a single instrument, the duduk, I believe, in the first iteration, with this sort of granular resonator synth drone happening, and it's just sustaining an A. Not only does that demonstrate that we're staying in tonic, everything is in A major because everything works over that sustained A, but it also indicates that that theme is well capable of standing on its own with just a single solo instrument playing it. Not only a single solo instrument playing it, I believe it's passed around between the duduk, the electric cello, the synthesizers have it in sort of the brassy tones that I have here later on. And at the end of the film, it comes back with a female vocal. And it would also work really well with just piano and nothing else, because it's a strong melodic idea. And that's an important concept to grasp. If it's a strong enough idea, 
the instrumentation is kind of irrelevant other than being able to color it the way that we want. And that also gives Zimmer a wide range for the ways that he can go on to develop that melody and reharmonize it later on in the film, depending on the context and the mood that he needs to evoke with it. So I thought I was done with this video and ready to upload it and go ahead and get that copyright strike out of the way. And then my wife and I rewatched part one and uh, I noticed something about the bagpipe theme that made me stop and go, that sounds incredibly familiar after shooting this video. It's in a different key, it has a very different mood and is in a different instrumentation, obviously, but the outline of it, there are some differences, but the outline of it and the harmonic progression uh, that it sort of implies, pretty much the same. <laughs> In particular, this second part of the theme. This termination is exactly the same. So I really wish that I were smart enough to have caught this the first time. But I do think it kind of proves the entire point of this video, which is this is a strong theme and this theme can withstand many variations. In this case, in part one, it's used as uh, the sort of military march anthem of House Atreides. In part two, it's used as the love theme for Paul and Shani. And that's because it's a strong theme and it's very versatile. So he begins to build the accompaniment underneath, but he doesn't tip his hand. He doesn't leave the tonic key area just yet. He's saving that for something important that's about to happen. And it takes an incredible amount of restraint as a composer to stay in one place for a long period of time. It takes confidence that that's what needs to happen. It not only can bear repeating, it wants to be repeated. And a lot of times as composers, I know speaking for myself, I get a little flighty and I feel like I should be doing something different because I've been in one place too long when the most honest and least pretentious thing I could do is just stay in that moment. Simple things can be really well crafted things. And in fact, I would argue that they're sometimes the most difficult things to pull off because just like sand walking across the desert, one false step can basically ruin everything that you've established up until that point. You're very exposed. If you are interested in learning more of the practical concepts that have helped me the most in my own compositional career, I've compiled those into a free ebook. And there I talk a little bit more about how to structure your melodic ideas, your form in general, and a little bit about harmony as well. That's gonna be the first link in the description below. You can check that out at your convenience. Now we move on to my absolute favorite part of this melody, the sort of climactic moment in the melody and it's what I'm calling the B phrase. It's kind of the second half of this whole thing. And we can quickly identify that we're someplace new and that something important is happening because he shifts to a higher register and also starts off with the biggest leap, the biggest interval that we've had so far in the whole theme. Really simple, really effective. We also are very aware that we're suddenly thrust into this new key area. We're no longer in A major, it seems, because this G natural doesn't belong in the key of A major. A major would have a G sharp. Now, for the theory nerds out there, and I know there are at least two of you watching, it feels like we're kind of in a secondary dominant territory where he's maybe going to D major. Sure enough, there is D major, but then he suddenly returns back to A major. And that feels totally out of character for this piece. It's like a different harmonic language. Suddenly we're transported to the common practice period. I don't think that works at all. And I think Zimmer realized it. So he immediately sort of diverts our expectations there. And back. 
So it's a little obscure. We're not certain where we are right now harmonically, but we know we're someplace new. We're in new territory. And he sort of messes with us just a bit, I think, in this reharmonization that happens underneath that. So it seems like we could be in any number of keys until the climax happens and he clearly lets us know we're not where you thought we were. E minor. Once again, using the power of repetition to drive home this climax, this incredibly powerful moment. And again, something similar. Guess what? One more time. He's done something different. I think this is important to mention that it's such a fine line to walk that balance between repeating something as much as it sort of wants to be repeated and overstaying your welcome. And I think he balances that absolutely perfectly in this particular case. He knows that this is powerful. And not only are we not tired of hearing it, we actually really want to hear it again. And just when we start to bask in the wonderful glow of this wonderful moment that has this great sense of both longing and sort of nostalgia, he throws a left turn at us. Here's that last iteration of this. So that really tasty C major is an example of modality. It doesn't belong to any of the key areas that we thought we've been in throughout the course of this entire piece. My composition teacher would call this a moment of harmonic freshness, and I think that's one of the best descriptors of these kinds of chords that feel fresh and feel surprising, but not in a way that is jarring or takes the listener out of the world that we've created. And he's saved that for the very, very end of this piece. It's kind of that last unexpected, really tasty surprise that we get <laughs> after going through this emotional journey of this really simple, but emotionally complex theme. <laughs> I think that this melody is one that's going to be remembered for a very long time, for generations even. And as we've seen, it's all born out of this incredible honesty and sense of carefully considered simplicity. It actually begs to be repeated, which is probably the reason that it hasn't left my brain since the first time that I heard it. Let me know your thoughts on this theme. Do you think it's going to stick around for a long time? What are some of your other favorite themes from either films or, you know, there's a lot of music that's been written outside of film music as well. Let me know some of your favorites in the comment down below. Thanks as always for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you soon.